Good afternoon. Today we're looking at chronic kidney disease in children. The objectives to define, to classify chronic kidney disease, to look at the pathophysiology, some initial investigations, and management. We've always defined chronic di kidney disease as a clinical syndrome whereby a patient gradually loses their kidney function. But the problem with that definition is that it's non-specific. So we'll go with the kidney disease improving global outcomes definition, which tells us that when a patient has abnormalities of kidney structure or kidney function or a decline in the glomerular filtration rate less than 60 for more than three months, that would be considered to be chronic kidney disease. Of note here, they include abnormalities of structure. So if you have a patient with dysplasia of the kidney, that patient has, for more than obviously three months, that's known as chronic kidney disease. If your patient has abnormal function, like if they have persistent proteinuria, persistent hematuria, for more than three months, that's chronic kidney disease. There's a classification system for the severity of chronic kidney disease provided by the National Kidney Foundation of America, and the staging is from 1 to 5 using GFR. So for children, we would use the Schwartz formula to calculate an estimated glomerular filtration rate. Um, the worst stage, which is stage 5, includes patients with less than uh, glomerular filtration rate less than 15 and those would be patients who probably require renal replacement therapy. And then the mildest form includes people with a glomerular filtration rate greater than 90. So that's where we would include our patients who have structural abnormalities, functional abnormalities, and yet they have a normal glomerular filtration rate. We don't know much about the epidemiology of chronic kidney disease because the range of chronic kidney disease is from mild to very severe. So the ones that come to medical attention are obviously the more severe forms of chronic kidney disease. But some, population, some, some places have done population-based studies, such as the Italian Kidney Project, where they had an incidence of chronic kidney disease of about 12 and a prevalence of 74 cases per million of age-related population. A review article found that the estimated incidence of chronic kidney disease among children ranges from 3 to 12 per million of age-related population. Chronic kidney disease, because in children it's more likely to be caused by structural congenital uh, anomalies, is more common in boys. Uh, remember, boys are, more are obviously going to be more likely to suffer from things like posterior urethral valves, uh, prune belly syndrome, for example. So that's why we tend to see an overrepresentation of males. And then indigenous populations such as Aborigines, um, Native Americans, and then also later on African Americans, Africans tend to have a higher prevalence of chronic kidney disease. Some of the factors may be genetic, but also some may be due to socioeconomic uh, factors. The causes of chronic kidney disease in children are different from those in adults. In adults, we talk about diabetes, hypertension as the leading cause. But in children, the causes tend to be different. So in children, things like structural abnormalities, here we're talking about things like congenital anomalies of the kidney, the urinary tract. Um, we're talking about ciliopathies. So ciliopathies, um, polycystic kidney either autosomal dominant or autosomal recessive, and then uh, kidney stones. Uh, for example, in Sudan, where it's very hot, tend to see more of uh, renal stones. So that would play a, a larger role as a causation of chronic kidney disease in children. Then as we get into the older age groups, the preteens, the teenagers, we begin to see more of glomerular diseases, things like steroid-resistant nephrotic syndrome, uh, a typical hemolytic uremic syndrome and other kinds of glomerular nephritic disorders. We know that the kidneys have large functional reserves. 
but even though they have this large functional reserve if the initial injury is severe or if the injury becomes sustained this can lead to permanent damage in the kidney so early observations that were done um, were that once the glomerular filtration rate dropped below half of what is considered normal which is roughly about 60 these patients would invariably progress um, even if the initial insult to the kidney was no longer present this is an early paper where they were plotting patients um, uh, inverse of the creatinine against time and they noticed that with time these patients renal function tended to reduce or to worsen and they also noticed that this reduction was present regardless of the disease so whether a patient's original disease was posterior urethral valves or it was diabetes nephropathy or if it was hypertensive nephropathy they all tended to sort of have this kind of a curve what differed was the steepness of the slope so based on these early studies they um, the, the early workers, uh, as I said, noticed that they, they, they tended to be a difference between individuals in terms of the slope of the curve. The shape of the, cave, the curve was of the, of the graph was the same, but the slope was different. Some people tended to lose their kidney function within weeks, others within months, others within um, uh, like a year, others it took decades for them to lose significant kidney function. So we had early workers in North America, such as Brenner, that worked with rats, for example, to try and study what happens when you, you remove portions of the kidney to see what happens to the remaining parts of the kidney. And they published this paper, which proposes a hypothesis to explain why we see this gradual, like once you hit loss of function in more than 50 percent of the kidneys we begin to see this gradual continuous loss in kidney function so they postulated that progression occurs through focal loss of nephrons and that because of the adaptive changes that occur in the surviving nephrons these changes which are meant to be adaptive actually prove to be detrimental to the kidney in the long run so they hypothesize that this progressive nature of kidney disease, chronic kidney disease, could be attributed, therefore, to a common pathway of mechanisms which were independent of the primary insult. Why this last bit? Because regardless of the disease that caused the initial insult, the curve tended to be the same. So essentially what they postulated was that uh, patients suffer primary injury that primary injury if it's severe enough or sustained enough leads to a reduction in the number total number of nephrons so it leads to loss of nephrons so obviously if the number of nephrons reduce it means that the remaining nephrons have to do more work so they have to carry the load of a greater load of the glomerular filtration rate and because of that there is hyperfiltration at the level of the individual nephron. Now, this hyperfiltration causes stress of the cells, causes physical damage to the cells, and because of this, inflammation is triggered. And we know that some of the factors that are released during inflammation lead to damage of the interstitium, inter, um, interstitium and also in addition, we get cells migrating into the interstitium. We get uh, cells um, undergoing change uh, in the interstitium. And we get uh, fibrosis being laid down in the interstitium. And this fibrosis was the final common pathway that Brenner postulated that regardless of what the primary insult was, it would all lead to this fibrosis, which would then lead to damage to the peritubular interstitium and we know that that peritubular interstitium is the one that carries the peritubular capillaries so therefore delivery of oxygen and nutrients to the tubules would be affected and therefore the tubules would therefore die 
and once the tubules would die, the glomeruli would be uh, would also be damaged, and eventually would get an even uh, greater loss of nephrons, which would mean that the glomerular filtration load was being carried by an ever decreasing population of healthy nephrons, which would be exposed to an ever increasing hyperfiltration and which would continue to lead to inflammation, which would again lead to fibrosis, and so it would become a vicious cycle. And so therefore, interstitial fibrosis was then postulated to be the final common pathway that leads to progressive chronic kidney disease. So, when we look at this inflammation that is triggered by um, this hyperfiltration, you get certain factors that are produced, factors such as the renin angiotensin system, oxidant stress, for example, in patients with anemia, factors such as growth factors like transforming growth factor, endocelin, adhesion molecules, and proteases. These have been found to enhance inflammation, whereas factors such as heme oxygenase, vitamin D, uh, relaxin, these factors tended to reduce inflammation. And then in addition, remember I said that they studied different patients. Like for example, they collected a population of patients suffering from the same disease. But even within that group, they noticed that patients would progress at different rates. So they studied some of the factors that influenced the steepness of that slope and they noticed that there were some factors which were modifiable and others which were non-modifiable. So non-modifiable factors included things like birth weight. birth weight. Birth weight correlates with the number of nephrons. So it means that if a patient had been born with a lower birth weight, they tended to have fewer nephrons. And if they had fewer nephrons, if, they suff if, if that patient suffered an equivalent kind of injury, with a patient who had a normal complement of proteins, this, that first patient was more likely to suffer more severe loss in terms of percentage loss of nephrons and therefore would be more likely to progress. Um, patients uh, with fewer nephron numbers, similar to birth weight, and then genetic factors such as certain polymorphisms of the ACE uh, gene, for example, or the Apple one gene in Africans, those were found to be risk factors for this quicker progression. And then ethnicity, as I said, Aborigines, Africans, African Americans tend to progress faster than Caucasians. And then age. So if an infant has chronic kidney disease, the child is more likely to progress during infancy as compared to um, a toddler. As again, another age at which progression is more likely to occur is during the growth spurt during puberty. Then we have modifiable risk factors. So these are things that we can do something about, things like hypertension. We've said that the major thing, the major driver of injury is the hyperfiltration. So therefore, if there's um, systemic hypertension, we're more likely to be seeing higher pressures even at the glomeruli. Um, and so therefore, there's higher risk of hyperfiltration, and that's been linked with quicker progression. Patients with proteinuria, so these ones um, are patients that have abnormal passage of albumin and other proteins into Bowman's space, and so therefore the cells of the proximal tubule, those epithelial cells are exposed to these uh, uh, proteins, and so they have to reabsorb them. This stresses the proximal tubular cells because they are overworked. They produce cytokines and other signals that trigger inflammation and leads to migration of inflammatory cells into the interstitial space, and that drives fibrosis. So the patients that had significant proteinuria were noted to progress faster. And then diabetes, if poorly controlled, also was linked to quicker progression. Obesity, because it's linked with hyperfiltration injury, 
even if the patient has no original chronic kidney disease, smoking because it's associated with uh, oxidative stress, then dyslipidemias and uh, abnormalities in calcium and phosphate, and then anemia because the low HP again is associated with poor oxygenation and therefore oxidative stress and then nephrotoxins. So if you have your patient who has chronic kidney disease and they continue suffering injury like recurrent uh, hypo, hy um, hypotension, recurrent um, shock episodes or exposure to nephrotoxic substances such as gemtamicin, you know, other nephrotoxic drugs, they may have had mild CKD, but because you didn't take care to remove these factors that damage the kidney, your patient is more likely to progress. So in terms of the clinical presentation of these patients, as I say, kidney injury ranges from stage 1 to stage 5. So they may be asymptomatic to very sick, but we normally think about normal kidney function. So any think about what the normal kidney does and think what would happen if any of those functions were to be taken away. So some patients are asymptomatic, they are found incidentally, and then other children will present with growth failure, and during assessment for growth failure, it will be realized that they have significant kidney disease. They may have the presence of one or a combination of the following abnormalities, abnormalities in calcium. Why calcium? Because we know that um, there's damage to the interstitium, the same interstitium that carries the cells that produce uh, 25 hydroxylase that leads to production of activated vitamin D and so therefore if that is not being produced we get low levels of calcium. Phosphorus levels would be high especially as the glomerular filtration uh, dis, uh, reduction becomes severe and then because of the low calcium levels P and high phosphate levels PTH production would be increased and then also vitamin D is low in, in many of these patients um, for dietary reasons but also as I say there's reduced 125 um, hydro, uh, hydroxylase activity and then also these patients will have anemia uh, for several reasons, they have a poor appetite, they're not feeding well, but also because of the uremia, they may have micro bleeds, they have anemia of chronic illness, which is associated with acute phase protein, hepcidin, which leads to um, reduced mobilization of iron stores, and then the patients may have hypertension, may present with hypertension, because of reduced glomerular filtration rate, so they are not passing out as much water, then they may come in with fluid overload. So edema, one of the differentials is renal failure. But here, um, there's a caveat that some patients with chronic kidney disease actually have polyuria, those especially with congenital anomalies that are unable to concentrate their urine, even up to late stages of chronic kidney disease, they may actually continue to pass huge amounts of urine. Patient may come in with acidotic breathing, which may be missed or mis, um, uh, misdiagnosed as a pneumonia, and other patients will have electrolyte in imbalance. So usually hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, um, others uh, come in with hyperphosphatemia, hypocalcemia, as said earlier. But there are others who may come in with hypocalcemia, so the exact abnormalities tend to differ from patient to patient, but by and large, hyperkalemia, hyponatremia. Investigations, if you think the patient has chronic kidney disease, obviously you want to confirm it. So you do urea, electrolyte creatinine, calcium, magnesium, phosphate, and then once you confirm that your patient indeed has uh, renal dysfunction based on the GFR, you want to find the cause. So full blood count, differential ESR would be useful. Um, you want to do an immune screen, so C3, C4, 
anchor, an infectious screen for hepatitis B, syphilis, HIV would be useful. You want to look for complications of the chronic kidney disease, so you might want to do um, parathyroid hormone, alkaline phosphatase, and then ion studies, but that's really for the later stages of chronic kidney disease. I haven't indicated it here. It's important to do a urinalysis as well. And then to also do some imaging, Base, basic imaging would be your kidney, ureter, bladder, ultrasound, and Doppler of the renal vessels. Why ultrasonography? You might find that you have a reversible cause. So if it's not severe chronic kidney disease by correcting um, that cause, like for example, if you find hydronephrosis, you may be able to preserve the kidney function for much longer. Management of chronic kidney disease has four goals. The first is to slow or prevent progression of the chronic kidney disease. Then we have symptomatic treatment. And then we want to optimize growth and development and then to prepare these patients for renal replacement therapy. So remember we said that there are certain factors that will slow progression, those modifiable factors. So our job is to try and control hypertension, to control the anemia, to prevent continued proteinuria so as to slow down progression, to prevent the patient coming into uh, or being exposed to nephrotoxins, avo avoiding dehydration episodes, avoiding nephrotoxic drugs so that we preserve their function for as long as possible. Or if they have an ongoing inflammatory process like glomerulonephritis, treat them for that so that we preserve their kidney function. Or if it's a child with bladder dysfunction, we manage the bladder dysfunction so that the kidney disease is not progressive. So the second part, symptomatic management, we'll go into a little bit later. Then we want to optimize growth and development and then to prepare the patient, as I've said, for replacement therapy. So why do they get growth failure? These children may be malnourished, may, may not be getting feeds because they have a poor appetite. They, have normal, uh, they may have abnormalities of calcium, phosphate. They may have acidosis that leaches the bone of calcium and phosphate that will affect growth. They have chronic inflammation. They may have an underlying problem that leads to chronic inflammation that affects growth. Some of the drugs that they may have been given to control the primary disease, like if they had steroid-resistant nephrotic syndrome, may affect growth. But chronic kidney disease itself causes resistance to growth hormone. So they, they, they may actually present with growth failure. How are we going to manage this? We are going to try and find out exactly what is the major contributor to this growth failure. If it's nutritional, with the help of the dietitian, optimize the nutritional status. If it's to do with acidosis, we'll correct that. If it's to do with calcium phosphate, we'll correct all of those factors. The patient uh, may present with mineral bone disease, so you may have a patient with abnormal levels of calcium, low calcium, so you may need to supplement them with calcium. They may have high phosphate, you may need to give them uh, phosphate binders, things like calcium phosphate uh, to, to bind the phosphate in their food. You, you may... Um, you, sorry. You may, you may have to give them vitamin D supplements. You, you may have to treat the rickets, for example, um, and watch the linear growth um, and, and make sure that the calcium phosphate product is normal so that you prevent soft tissue abnormalities. And then you also want to manage the anemia. By giving, by giving phosphate, uh, sorry, not phosphate, but um, folic acid, um, ferrous um, sulfate, if that's indicated. And what's driving the anemia, as I said, is probably the hepcidin, the lack of erythropoietin, the microbleeds, and so on. So erythropoietin may be indicated. You want to control the hypertension, so you give antihypertensives. Remembering that for more severe forms of CKD, you avoid 
giving things like uh, enalapril, which or you may struggle with hyperkalemia because they are potassium sparing. Then you manage fluids, electrolytes. If your patient is overloaded, you can try diuretics. You can you need to fluid restrict them. See if you can manage them conservatively for as long as you can. Um, give them low potassium feeds. You can give uh, potassium uh, binders like tiaxylate, uh, sodium resonium, and they, you can also give either sodium citrate or oral bicarbonate to maintain the serum bicarb at about 2022. And then you may you also it's important to deal with the psychosocial issues because this is a chronic severe illness for the more severe forms. So we need to work with the family to help them see how they can cope. So social worker to help them if they are having problems with housing, with coping in that way. Psychologist to help the family to cope uh, psychologically. And then we prepare our patient. Ideally, once the patient reaches stage 3, they should be referred to nephrology where we begin to prepare the family in terms of what type of renal replacement therapy is available, um, dialysis versus transplantation, at what point these will be given. We plan what type of um, access for dialysis. Are they wanting peritoneal dialysis? Are they wanting HD if it's HD? Is the child suitable for an AV shunt? Should they have um, a catheter? We make arrangements. Is it going to be hospital-based dialysis? Is it home dialysis? We try and identify the potential donor. And as the kidney dysfunction worsens, we begin to prepare by um, doing histocompatibility testing, making sure vaccines have been done. We make sure that the bladder of this patient who is a potential recipient of the kidney, their bladder function is optimized and basically prepare the patient to manage a patient who may need to receive transplantation. So those are a few of the references in, the, in case you want to look them up. Thank you.